Morton and Lasse have ta talked about data analytics in their classes and how they might identify students at risk um, early in their, their term. I want to take that to a, a next level because I use the data from my LMS at the University of Michigan. We happen to use Canvas. It doesn't matter. I'm looking at the data coming from the LMS. And in addition to that, I'm going to measure more things about my students than you may normally measure. And I'm trying to convince you today that the measurement of yet more data in the classroom leads to much greater value for you as educators. Channel changer. So is an early warning system too late? Many of the early warning systems we have now are based on what grades the students are getting as this term goes on. My interest is can I predict the student's potential for success or failure based on how they behave in class? And for this, I tell my students on the first day that I'm going to put a probe in you. I'm going to measure everything you do this semester. If you're uncomfortable with that, you might want to take a different course. Or they can also opt out, in which case I don't collect their data. My course, called Extreme Weather, has about 220 students in it. Of those, about five decided not to participate. The rest are comfortable sharing their data. I want to show you how I do that. This tool that I use from Echo 360 allows me first of all, to share my slides from PowerPoint directly with the students so they can see the slides that I'm working on on their laptops, on their phones during class. My class is also blended, so it is both synchronously, uh, you can, yes, you can still physically come to class, but if you choose not to, you can still watch class live from wherever you are and interact with me from wherever you are. I also allow that the students can take notes that are synchronized with the slides. If you click on the notes afterwards, it then takes you to that spot in the video about what was happening during class. I allow the students, this is a student's idea. They wanted to be able to pose questions to me. And this winds up being so important because normally, and for the educators in the room, if you ask this question, any questions? That's the sound you get, right? Few would actually raise their hand. It turns out that about 40% of the male students say they're comfortable asking a verbal question, but only about 25% of the female students. So if you teach class in a traditional way, you have basically made an uneven playing field in the classroom. But by making this so they can ask questions and everybody sees the questions and sees the answers that I give or my teaching assistant gives during class, it turns out the two things will happen. First of all, you'll get way more questions. So instead of the 10 or 12 you might get over the semester, I now get like 500 questions every semester. And the female students are asking twice as many questions as the male students. Victory. The play, playing field is now level. Everyone is participating. You're going to get a lot of very stupid questions, but you're inviting the students to participate, and this is good. I also have a button here for, they can simply say, is this going to be on the exam? So they can bookmark the slides. And they can indicate when they're confused. In the States, I call it the WTF button. What is that boy talking about? And you can indicate when you're confused. But what's happening here is I'm inviting you with your technology to participate with me, to take notes, to answer my questions, to tell me when you're confused, to ask questions during class. And all this allows the class to be far more participatory than ever. And yeah, you, if you're sitting away, you can watch the video in class and what's being projected on the screen. This is my instrument. And everything the students are doing during class is being recorded. This data about what students do in the classroom during class winds up to being far more predictive than any data that you'll get from the LMS. Period. I'm going to show you the results here in a moment. One of the things I like to t try to teach in class and which makes it, I think, special, to answer your question, is this metacognition. I'm trying to help the students understand what they don't understand. And many tools allow you to do that with clickers, for example, student response systems. Here I can ask a multiple choice question in classes. I have what conditions make the atmosphere less stable, but I also can require that they tell me why they chose that answer. And then I can click on any one of these buttons up here and show their justifications for why they chose, in this case, B. 
and I can talk about their justifications. Did you get it right for the wrong reason? Are you getting it wrong for the right reason? So this is a way that I can have far more interaction with the students. They are participating and I'm giving them something back. It's a feedback mechanism here. Likewise, being a meteorologist, I like to ask questions about imagery. For example, what on this image does not make sense to you and why? And you could put a dot on the Imagine where you would right now. Where would you put a dot on the map? And what would you say? So the students can put their dots on the map. I, there's the responses from my students. What I've done here is I've now ch changed the class format so they are actually designing what we do next. Because for each of these dots, I can now roll over any one of the dots and see why did you choose that, that, that spot? That why are there no storms coming off the coast of South America? That's a superb question. Why is South, the South Atlantic different than the North Atlantic in terms of tropical storms? Or why are there no hurricanes along the equator? Again, I was hoping for that question. It leads to a conversation about the dynamics of hurricanes. So imagine what you might do in your own discipline with imagery and engaging the students and having them participate and ask the questions which leads to, leads to a discussion, the class I've been teaching at the university for 38 years. And this is the, like the first, this class is so much more interactive and dynamic than I've ever had before. It just changes the feel in the room. And the students, yes, they're going to have their technology, and yes, they can go off and do Facebook, but you're going to bring them back because you're going to pose questions and have them take notes and such so that they are going to be grabbing their attention as class goes on. So I collect a lot of data in the classroom. What do you do with this amount of data? Well, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> That's just, if you have this huge amount, I have how a, do you even swim through? <laughs> well, and I should point out that this tool, I made it for my class in Echo 360, God bless them, uh, acquired it, and now it's used by some three million students worldwide. So I have access to, I'm used to dealing with large data sets being a meteorologist, first of all. So this is a, a new example for how I can use the same tools I use for weather forecasting, accurate as they may be, and apply them to the classroom. And here I can see, for example, oops, uh, I can't do that. Can I go back? I can't. There we go. So for example, here I got a pointer. Up here in the upper right-hand corner, I can see that the number of notes students take are related to grades. I can see on the left, that the number of questions, this makes no sense, if the number of questions are getting correct during class is also related to grades and strongly. If the students are getting the questions right during class, they're probably gonna do well on the exam. Like, duh. So we should be collecting that data. You should be quizzing your students. Have formative assessment during class. Getting that feedback, you'll identify which students are in trouble very easily through that simple step. But these data of, of I'm knowing whether they look at the videos after class, how much they reflect on their notes. Uh, this gets really creepy in a moment. I'm actually mining their notes in real time, clustering them into similar note structures, and that way I'm able to actually show the advisors what are the notes the students are hearing in class, which are the notes they're not hearing in class. Now as an advisor, you can have a far more specific conversation with your student about what you should and should not be doing in class. Me, as a meteorologist, telling you to work harder after you've just failed an exam, do more of what you just did, is terrible advice. If I can tell them specifically about their notes or about attentiveness or such, where I can see if they're actually gonna change their behaviors, now I can do something very more uh, focused in the classroom. So with these data, we are able to mine everything the students are doing during class, which tells us a great deal about how attentive, how engaged the student is, and to what degree is that related to their grades. And we are seeing that there are some very strong relationships here. Wow, so you can actually predict pretty uh, confident, confidently who is going to pass the exam at the end of the course of, and who's going to fail? Yeah, again, I'm a meteorologist, so I predict confidently all the time. <laughs> Not necessarily with great skill. But in this case, um, whoops, in this case, wrong button. On the left, I try to d demonstrate here that I'm not able to predict 
which students are going to fail, and by fail I'm saying get less than 70% on the first exam. And I'm able to do this in week two, week two of the semester. And on the left you see that I, I, I predicted 56 would get less than 70 on the exam, uh, and 56 did in, fa in fact did get less than 70 on the exam. And 49, I predicted, would get higher than that on the exam, and they did. And then there was a few where I didn't forecast so well. But the accuracy here is about 77% in week two. Now, in this case, I used three parameters. What's their incoming grade point average? And second, how many of the slides that I'm presenting, like here, are you uh, actually viewing in class? Which is a, a measure of attentiveness. I'm even measuring, for example, that when I change the slide here, how long is it before you change your slide? <laughs> how attentive are you? <laughs> in addition to that, you know, I'm looking at how many notes they, they but I'm also looking at the, how many fraction of questions they got correct. So these are the three parameters. Now you might well ask, maybe you won't know the student's incoming grade point average. So I remove that also, and then your accuracy drops to about 70%, but it's still 70%. So with reasonable accuracy, by week two, you're able to identify who is going to be in trouble. This, I will tell you, is the easy part. Now what do you do? If I know that you, I'm picking on you, are going to fail my class, how do I help him? What am I going to do to motivate him to change his behavior to come more in line, be more successful. This is the challenge I'm facing at the moment, and this is where I'm trying to work with advisors at the institution to think about how can, if you had access to these data and now you have to sit down with your student, you would have the power to know more about how they're actually behaving in class, and then you would then hopefully guide them towards a more successful uh, outcome in, in, in class. So you're coming next year and you'll tell us all the secrets. And all yeah. the recipes. Well, I'll already tell you my secret. <laughs> so, so having identified these, and by the way, and this shows on the right side here, uh, the accuracy over time. So the accuracy peaks for me about week two or three, where I can identify students at risk. But the, my intervention right now, you're going to think, is extremely naive. Being, I'm a meteorologist. My invention, uh, intervention is simply to have coffee with the students. And I am drinking a lot of coffee now. <laughs> and for half of the students, I'm just talking, just sitting down and talking to them, just one-on-one, -on -one, what's going on, you know, how's it going? And for half of them, I'm sitting down and having this conversation and showing them these data to see, is it, you know, meeting with them have an effect? Does meeting with them and showing them some real data have an effect? And the beauty of this kind of system is once I've done that, the next day I can see if their behaviors have changed. So there's an opportunity here to do, to do the research. You don't need a control group anymore because they are the control group, how they behave before it. And can you change, can I change a student's behavior? I'm excited about this because I think if we can start collecting data in the classroom, it offers huge opportunities for us to identify students at risk and for us to design those interventions so that next year I can come back and say, yes, I did change a student and they became successful after this. I also have some other tools I cannot show in public yet. And I would love, invite you to come. Oh, dang it. I hit the wrong button. I hit I blank. Think it's, uh, you oh, no, can it I go off, back even. here? There we go. Wow. Thank you. Uh, I invite you either to email me, and I will share it with you, or I will be at this booth, Echo 360 booth, both after this session and tomorrow. And if you want to come by, I'll show you what you can do with students' notes in real time uh, in the classroom and how you can use those to, uh, to help guide the students as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank you.